going to do a little Bible study this morning in the book of Daniel as we open this word up. As Christians today, we face a real tension between living in this world and living of the world. Adding even more tension to the world today is the challenge we get from Jesus to make disciples of this world. So how can we make disciples of this world if we're not living in the world? We see some Christians, they go to the far extreme of building their own communes and living in a a walled community with no outside influence and uh, some of those end up being cults we read about, but there's some that are fairly decent, but they are shutting themselves out of everything that the world has to offer. And it relieves them somewhat of that responsibility that Jesus gave them to make disciples. Then we have the other extreme where people embrace the world, but they embrace everything of the world has to offer. There was a saying one time when, uh, when the church joins the world, there's no reason for the world to join the church. And I think that's the stance that we need to take, that we need to join the world, but be careful of what we join with the world. Some Christians have withdrawn. They shut themselves out. They don't want anything to do. They even go as far as not even voting because they feel that it's ridiculous, it's all crooked, it's all deceitful. I think it's a tool that God gave us, and as Christians, we should utilize the voting. Oh, by the way, voting's coming up too, isn't it? Yeah. And we have a Christian responsibility to help choose our leaders. You know, without the Christian influence in choosing our leaders, we could get some pretty bad leaders, worse than what we have today. So it's our responsibility to do that. Others have openly embraced all aspects of our culture today, which helps them reach the loss somewhat, but it compromises their faith. It compromises their faith. I also think we need to be reminded uh, of that great commission to go into the world and to teach. In other words, as Christians, we embrace the parts of culture that are godly. Now, there is culture out there that's godly. Uh, If we look at, uh, and I'll call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's a lot easier than some of those other names that they have there. Their main thing that they started being taught was the language, the language of Babylon. The language of Babylon that time uh, was mostly Aramaic. There were some others thrown in there as well. Now, there's nothing wrong with learning a different language. So we see as they're being tested or or not tested but taught, a different lifestyle and culture by the language that they are using, there's nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of culture today in our society that is good. We live in a society today that culture has shifted to the electronic age. And there's nothing wrong with the electronic age. Uh, Some of us can't keep up with it. Uh, I, for one, I still like the old flip phone. People, uh, Dan Blank, but remember Dan was over and he, he was down in uh, the Ark. The Ark had a big gospel concert and things this week, and then he's going on. And he, my phone's ringing, and I'm thinking, what's going on? And here he's texting me stuff from the Ark, and I can't answer him. I have no idea how to get back to him. So I waited at break time, and then I called him on the phone and said, Dan, I'm not getting you. And there's nothing wrong with the electronic age. But when we look at some of the ways the electronic age is being used today, the pornography that goes across computers, the nuisance calls we get from the robot calls, some of those are very annoying and disturbing. 
uh, some other things that's going on with the electronic age today. Uh, as I say, it's good, but it's how we use it turns bad. And I'm sure that uh, Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach faced these same situations as they started in their training with that. The opening verses, two verses of the book of Daniel, indicate that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded Jerusalem uh, in the third year of the reign of Jehozo Jehoiakim, who was king of Judah. And uh, we didn't read those two verses for you, but you can read them a little bit later. Uh, the scene then quickly shifts to Daniel and his three friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their names were changed. Uh, in fact, Daniel's name was changed also to Belshazzar, but uh, most of scripture still refer to him as Daniel. Uh, look at verses 3 through 5 as we prepare into this. The king then ordered Asaphats, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Uh, when, Jews, when the Jews were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, a, a lot of uh, young men were taken. And the reason for that was to help build this uh, servanthood of Nebuchadnezzar is up. They, was, they were told to select only strong, healthy, and, and good-looking young men. He said, make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning. Remember, he wants the trainees almost to make robot types out of these so that they would be fully and totally submitted to following Nebuchadnezzar. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning. Make sure they're gifted with knowledge and have good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. I think, uh, I think we ought to highlight that and put that on our applications for our uh, politicians today, uh, that we choose men with those qualities. Train these young men in the language and the literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchen. I often heard the story, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. And I'm beginning to believe that Belshazzar thought that same thing too. They were to be trained for three years. Now this wasn't just a month training or so on. This was going to go on for three years. And then they would enter the royal service if they met the king's requirements and his questioning. He would question them at the end of these three years. King uh, Nebuchadnezzar orders uh, his servant to bring some of the young men from Judah so he could incorporate them into the Babylonian culture. Uh, as offense was to look for men possessing these very special and, and sound qualifications. First, where they were to be from the royal family, high ranking out of the family of Judah. Uh, that would also fit in with uh, the Nebuchadnezzar's plans to use only royalty in his cabinet as well. They would train these young men and then uh, insert, them, insert them into the society of Judah uh, to help convert the Jews to come over into the ways of uh, Babylon as well. Second, the young men were to be from uh, nobility or members of high social standing in Judah. That would also get the uh, Jews to side with these trained men to also mix in with the Babylonians. These qualifications for the uh, hostages clearly indicated that the Babylonians thought the brightest and the most influential young men of their time. If, if you want to get a program done, you look for the most influential people around. This is what King Nebuchadnezzar had in mind. We also see that the Babylonians were to find young men who were without physical defect and were very good looking. You know, back in biblical days, physical defects were looked upon uh, as people who were sinners. And, and many times they were cast out uh, of society because of these physical defects. And so the king wanted none of this in his court as well. The king had an image to uphold. And so the captives uh, needed to be in good health and to be good representatives for the king. Uh, 
These captives also needed to have mental strength, the ability to hold up under pressure. They had to be uh, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledge, and perspective. The young men needed the ability to retain knowledge as well. Uh, and this is one of the reasons I think they chose young men. Uh, I know as I get a little bit older, my memory is very, very good, but it's so short. And uh, so they wanted men that could remember, young men, men that could uh, survive for many years yet. Last, these young men needed to be capable of serving in the king's palace. Uh, the king wanted the best of the best to serve him. The final phrase in verse 4 indicates the process for training the young men in the Babylonian culture. It was to teach them the language. Uh, first and foremost uh, was the language to be taught to the uh, captives. Uh, without that, there was no way they could communicate the Jews to the Babylonians. And so it was very important that they would be able to do this. And as I said before, at the time in Babylon, Aramaic was a popular language. Uh, but Chaldean was also a scholarly language was used as well. So it just wasn't one language that they had to learn. It was a variety of languages. The captives would, be, would have to need a uh, fluency in both languages. So the captives were immersed in the study of both languages. And from that, we know these, clap, these captives readily submitted to these training and instructions of the Babylonian culture. And that was good. Not all assimilation to culture was bad then and neither is it today as we shared with you earlier. Some of these trainings would have included historical writings. Uh, nothing wrong with learning about our history. I think today we are getting away from some of that. Uh, I was told, I don't know how true it is, I was told and maybe somebody has a better answer, that right now in high schools, there's not much history taught beyond the war, war, uh, Vietnam War. Now, that's a shame that we live in a country that was founded on very godly principles and went through some very rough times to gain the freedoms that we have in this country, and yet it's not being taught to our children today. I think that's, we're losing some of the heritage of the United States of America, and uh, it's you can see where it's heading us, not in a very good place. Some others would be uh, economic uh, situations that were being taught to them. Religious, myths, poetry, and other aspects of the Babylonian culture were being taught to these men over this three-year period. In verse 5, we see another requirement that these captives were to be involved in. They would receive daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that the king drank. The young men had the problem of receiving the best food that was fit for the king. By doing this, the officials would ensure good health for the men and also probably encourage their adjustment into Babylonian culture quicker. As I said, wait a man's stomach is through his food. The rich food, who would... Who wouldn't rather have steak smothered with onions and mushrooms and steak sauce than an old dried up hamburger? Amen. Surely they want to feed these king's uh, recruits the best possible food they could eat. Well, the problem with this is uh, there was two problems with that. First of all, the king's food was offered to the idols of Babylon before it was served. And that was against Jewish law. Second of all, some of the food the Jewish law had made in the book of Leviticus, certain foods they could not eat. And you all remember pork was one of those that the Jewish nation was not to be eating at that time. And, and it doesn't, while it doesn't tell us that uh, the king's food was pork, uh, we can assume there may have been foods in there that uh, were against the dietary laws of the Jewish people. But I think the biggest reason was because the food was offered to the uh, Babylonian gods before it was served to the king. Uh, 
Well, jump to verses 8, and 13, 8 through 13, we read, But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. I, I think as we stop there a minute and read that sentence there, we realize the sovereignty of God. Uh, God knew the position that these uh, three men, four men were in. Uh, God knows our positions that we're in today, too. And he goes before them. He prepared the heart of this uh, servant by somehow, in his way, uh, having this man feel compassion for these men. Uh, because we can see how he reacted. The servant replied, I am afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youth your age, I am afraid the king will have me behead beheaded. He pours out his heart, even though he has compassion for Daniel, Meshach, Abednego, and Shadrach. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel. Please test us for 10 days. Not, not the three-year period of testing. This is only 10 days Daniel asked for. And we also see out of this uh, verses of scripture, Daniel reacted with a compromising mood. Now, compromise can be two things. It can be good or it can be bad. Today, we compromise with the world when it comes down to abortion and, and homosexuality and transgenders and all this stuff that's going on today. We even have churches today that are promoting some of these ideas. Doctors and physicians who are helping these kids and these people with changing their sex and their transgenders around Compromise with the world the way the thinking is. But here we see Daniel, Meshach, Abednego asked for a test for 10 days of a diet of vegetables and water. They didn't, they didn't get boisterous about it. They didn't threaten the guard with an opportunity to, to uh, do this testing for 10 days. Very meekly, they just asked for permission from him to do it. And as he said, in God's sovereignty, God prepared the heart of this servant to allow that compromised situation to take place. Daniel says, then make your decision in light of what you see. We must draw the line where we will not compromise. Although Daniel embraced the culture of language and literature according to the previous verses, he stood firm on this particular subject. We should say, why would Daniel forgo eating such elegant food? Well, we gave you those two reasons. First, the Babylonian's food often violated the chietary laws, and second, uh, it was offered to the gods of Babylon. It was one thing to learn the myths and the stories of the Babylonian guides, but it was another thing to participate in the rituals and receive food from these rituals. Daniel made up his mind to be devoted to principle and to be committed for a course of action. When Daniel made up his mind not to defile himself, he was being true to a lifelong determination to do what was right and not to give in to the pressures around him. We too are often assaulted by pressures to compromise our standards and live more like the world around us. Larry Klopp, many of you remember Larry Klopp, the property manager up at uh, Twin Pines. When I pastored Bartonville up there, he used to always make a statement, he'd say, the time to make a decision is before the decision is to be made. In other words, we need to prepare our heart. We, we need to read God's word constantly so that when a decision such as this faces us, we know what decision we're going to make already. We read about God's word and about 
the abortion issue. It's, it's not abortion, it's murder. And we know what God's word says about that. And we should be able to react according to God's word and, and not the way society is turning today. It's easier to resist temptation if you have already thought about your convictions before temptation arises. Daniel and his friends made their decision to be faithful to the laws of God before they even faced this king's dietary requirements. We would get into more trouble if we have not previously decided where to draw the line. As Joshua said, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that was his conviction. He would raise his children to serve the Lord. Before such uh, situations arise, decide on your commitments and what you will do. Then when temptations rise, you will be ready to say, no thanks. In verse 10 through 13, we see the first test of Daniel and his friend in Babylon. The Babylonians were trying to change their thinking by giving them a Babylonian education, their loyalty by changing their names, and their lifestyle by changing their diet. Without compromising, Daniel found a way to live by God's standards in a culture that did not honor God. We live in a culture today that is slowly turning away from honoring God. We need to get more into God's word. We need to know, we need to read more about Daniel. We need to learn more about Paul from the New Testament. We need to learn more about these godly characters that God used in the past to set an example for us today. Without compromising, Daniel found a way to live by God's standards in a culture that did not honor God, wisely choosing to negotiate rather than to rebel. So many times we strike out in rebellion against these principles when a negotiation process would be a lot better. <coughs> Excuse me. Without compromising, Daniel quickly thought of a practical, creative solution that saved his life and the lives of his companions as well. In verses 14 and 16, we learn the results of Daniel's plan. The refusal of the king's food not only did not harm them, but they were better and healthier than those who ate the king's food. We also see the providence of God as Daniel's life, in Daniel's life as he prepared the heart of the chief official to allow Daniel to bargain with him. The chief official knew what would happen and very fearful of what would happen if Daniel and those three men appeared uh, in worse condition than the others who were eating the king's food. It would be his fault for the condition of these men. But God is so great all the time, and God gave these men great health. In fact, we are told that Daniel and his three friends were healthier and better nourished than those who ate the king's food. As Christians, we do not need to make a Nuisance of ourselves when we stand against ungodly aspects of the culture today. I can remember back, and that's years ago, when Roe versus Wade first started taking place. And some Christian circles were burning down abortion clinics, were shooting at abortion doctors. That's not the right way to go about it, people. Look at the way that Daniel handled his situation. We need to search the scriptures. We need to pray to God and find God's way to get around these situations that we face today. If we as Christians act bravely and arrogantly in rejecting these ungodly aspects of our culture today and, and offend those who we are trying to reach, how are we ever going to reach them? I believe as Christians we can reject these ungodly aspects and still be respectful of those and still hold to the truths of scripture. In verse 17 through 19, we, we see the results of uh, Daniel's negotiations. God gave these four men 
an unusual appetite, aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. It wasn't only their physical health that God blessed, it was their knowledge. In fact, what happened? God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. And how did that play out later in life, in Daniel's life? When we read more about how he was the only one that can interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, and so they entered the royal service. Here we see more blessings that God gave Daniel and his friends. God gave them knowledge and understanding. They excelled in the curriculum of Babylon. Uh, but Daniel additionally comprehended visions and dreams. The Babylonian culture placed a high priority on these interpretation of dreams and visions. Very high. They were uh, hired uh, people who were hired specifically for this job that they would uh, interpret dreams. These kings were many times troubled by dreams that they could not understand. And they needed to know. They needed to know what was going on. Well, God gave Daniel that extra special ability to interpret those for them. To serve as a representative in the royal palace, Daniel was exposed to the skills of professional seers who were trained in the ancient art of analyzing dreams. But God enabled Daniel to, to gain expertise above what these other men had studied. The God-given discernment allowed Daniel to, to correctly evaluate and repudiate Babylonian fallacies and inaccuracies. And this led to Daniel being promoted even higher in the king's palace. Verses 18 through 19, we see that at the end of the three-year training period, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar, a crucial test for the Hebrews and their trainees as well. If they failed, it wasn't only the Hebrews' children that would be uh, probably murdered, but the guards who trained them would probably have been killed as well. And the same may have been to the chief official, especially that chief official, as the king would have looked at this as a neglect of duty on his part. But as we see, Nebuchadnezzar was impressed. In fact, no one was found equal, we were told. Therefore, Daniel and his friends began to serve in the king's court. And now if the story of Daniel and his friends ended there, we might be inclined to assume that after that, they never faced any more trials. But you need to read the rest of the book of Daniel. And you will discover more trials of David's faith and how he stood his ground. And by standing his ground, even in the threat of death, God delivered. When we start, strive to live as ambassadors for Jesus and we stand on our convictions... We can be catalysts instead of fatalists. We can be evangelists instead of pessimists. We can live with convictions in such a way that we, like Daniel, became known as transformers, not conformers. The verse from Romans also reminds me in relation to this 12 verses. Yeah, chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to text and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Well, Daniel's life went on. He was still in captivity. Chapter 3 tells us about the fiery furnace. They would not bow before the idol of the king. A servant reported them to King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar says, bring them here. Confronts them, 
threatens them with thrown in a fiery furnace, heated 70 times hotter than any furnace. In fact, the furnace was so hot that when they threw Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel in, the men who threw them in died. The next day, the king looks in and he sees four men up and walking about. It was said that there was not even a smell of smoke in their clothing when they brought him out of that fiery furnace. Daniel and his friends said, if God be for us, nobody can be against us. If we are consumed in the fire, we win because we'll be in God's presence. And if it's God's will, he will save us from this fire. And that happened. We continue to read on and we remember Daniel in the lion's den. I'm sure none of us would want to be thrown into a den of hungry lions. Daniel says, he delivered me, he will deliver me again. And we know the story, God sent the angels to shut the lion's mouth. But he stood his conviction. He would not bow to idols, he would not worship an idol. His true worship was to God above. And that was Daniel's conviction all through life. And it paid him great rewards. We live in a world today where our convictions are being compromised. How are we going to stand against them? One day we will all stand before God and give an account. Will we hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful service? Because we stood on our convictions. We didn't go out and bash people's heads. We didn't destroy property. We don't shoot people because they don't agree with us. But we negotiate. And we keep sharing the love of Christ with those around us. What was God's most important commandment? That you love one another. Love one another. Not the hatred that's going on today. Let's all be a Daniel in a world that is slowly going in an uncompromising situation or a bad compromising situation, I'd say. Let's not get caught up in a compromise, but let's negotiate. Father God, it's hard. And you know that. We live in a world that is compromising in so, so many situations. But we trust in your word. We trust in its great faithful promises. We know that you are still in control, even as out of control the world seems to be getting. So give us the strength through your Holy Spirit day by day that we continue to make a stand for the faithfulness unto you as you have been faithful unto us over the very many ages of time. And we'll always remain faithful as well. Give us that strength day by day, Lord, we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, I guess our last two hymns.